And the lesson begins a thought about longing for the pure milk of the word. Uh, we have at least two lessons here. We might have more than one depending on, well, just depending on how it goes and what the time factor looks like. But long for the pure milk of the word is a phrase that comes to us by way of First Peter chapter 2. You might be familiar with it in the second and the third verses of First Peter 2. Where it says, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, or if you have tasted that the Lord is good. Peter, writing the first of his letters to the twelve tribes of the dispersion, the pilgrims of the dispersion, according to chapter 1, verse 1, is writing at a time when the church was scattered from Jerusalem because of persecution that arose over Stephen, or in connection with Stephen, as Acts 8 records for us. And they were scattered, and they, they spread the word. And churches then were, you know, local churches were being established all over the place. And so Peter writes a letter to all of the churches because he is an apostle. And he has the authority for this. And he says to us, that we ought, like newborn babies, to long for the pure spiritual milk, or milk of the word, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. That we, as you know, Christians getting our start, we ought to be like newborn babies in some sense, that we desire to grow and we desire the spiritual milk or the milk of the word, the way that the baby desires mother's milk, so that we may grow up the way that the baby grows up. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, he says. And that's a quotation. But I wanted to take it apart and look at these things because I started at first to say, well, this is a fairly simple thought and we can, you know, we can explore this in, in, a, in a setting without a lot of trouble. But, you know, nothing stays simple for very long as you start looking at it and you realize there's actually a lot to these things. So I would like us to take the time to look at them because they're very useful. We do want to grow and we do want the purity of the nourishment that comes from God. So the first thing is what it says there as newborn babes, or like newborn infants. And we'll focus on that here for a moment, if you will. We're talking here at 1 Peter 2 about something that started earlier in the letter, and it's being continued here, which is this idea that the child of God grows up we are to be children of God. You have it, 1 Peter 1, uh, this idea, if you call on the Father, verse 17, it says, if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, then conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Which is to say, if you call on him as your Father, Well, if God is your father, then you are a child of God. That's the idea. You have been born again, as, uh, as Jesus said, recorded in John 3, of spirit and of water, when you were baptized in the name of Jesus for forgiveness of sins. Then God becomes your father. And this is the metaphor that he's talking about. The comparison here is that we are children of God in the spirit, if you call on him as your father, and he, by without partiality, judges according to each one's work, meaning it's not favoritism, it's not nepotism. The die is not cast because of who you are or who you are born to. 
He judges without partiality. His judgment is right. It's based on works. What have we done in the body? If so, then we conduct ourselves throughout the time of our stay here in fear. But this is a child of God, you see, at the first, first Peter 1 Peter 1.17. It's clear. If we call him our father, we are his children, but we are obedient children. We walk in a certain amount of fear, which is respect. There's accountability. But it continues, as you may note, in the 22nd verse, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, verse 23, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, born through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So we are born again. We referred earlier to John 3, and of course here he also is referring to this. But we are born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. This is not an earthly birth, according to the flesh. It is a spiritual thing, and it is through the Word of God, verse 23 of 1 Peter 1. The Word is the means by which we are born again. That's what makes Christians. The Word of God is what makes Christians. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of Christ, Romans 10, 17. This, this is the idea that he's tapping into in the ch second chapter in the verses we're looking at, at verse 2, like newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow by it. All right, we are God's children. We are growing up by the purity of that milk, which is to say the sustenance that God provides. And we come to him as uh, to a living stone, verse 4 of 1 Peter 2 says. And you see we're being built up, a spiritual house, at verse 5. The result of this is the ninth verse. You are a chosen generation. Generation of humankind, that is, a chosen race. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, we weren't, but now we are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, we had not, but now we have obtained mercy. This also is a quotation from the prophets. But you see that this is a comparison to a child, a dependent child. We call on him as father, we depend on him to give us the instruction that we need to grow up. We depend on him to give us the nourishment that we need to grow up. We have been born again according to his word or through his word. And the result of this is that we are that chosen race, that royal priesthood, that holy nation, his own special people. This also has to do with being a child of God and growing up. What are you growing up into? The mature adulthood of Christ, Ephesians 4 and Hebrews 5 is that you are a chosen race. You are the children of God. We are the Israel of God, Galatians 6 talks about. So the comparison here at the start of Peter is to a child of, of God, that God's child grows up from infancy to adulthood, to maturity. And that's what we are to be. And the means by which we do it, again, in chapter 1, 23, it's through the Word of God that we are born. And in chapter 2, 2, it's by the pure milk of the Word, which some say is the spiritual milk. We'll talk about that. But first, what does it mean to long for that milk in the second verse of 1 Peter 2? So let's look at this thing. Having considered the newborn baby or the infant, let's consider what it is to long for it. As newborn babies, desire or long for the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. Well, let's get a definition here, first of all. I'd like to look at this in the context of Scripture. In the New Testament, this word for longing or desiring occurs fairly often and usually it's longing for other people. 
as is captured at Philippians 1.8, I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. I long for you. Although sometimes it's for something that you want or that you need, like at 2 Corinthians 5.2, where we are suffering in the flesh and we long to put on our heavenly tent, to put off this earthly tent and put on the heavenly tent. I remember well that our brother Mike was telling me about this just a few weeks ago. He longed to put on that heavenly dwelling. But it's the idea that there's something else you need. You long for this. You realize that you have a genuine need. And over at James 4 and verse 5, it says he yearns jealously over the spirit he's made to dwell in us. God really wants us to be with him in spirit. He wants to dwell among us. He wants us to be his people. That's a longing that God has. And when it says he's jealous over that spirit, this also is talking about Exodus 20, where the Ten Commandments are given. And the jealousy is outlined there. It's not the kind of jealousy that we think of that is this uh, you know, fault in our thinking or fault in our character that is a selfish kind of thing. This word is talking about the feeling, the righteous feeling of, of that love and of that uh, dedicated relationship like a marriage is. It's right for a husband and a wife to feel that jealousy for one another. And it's right for God to feel that jealousy for us, his people. And we ought to feel that for him too, that we desire him and we desire his word, and we don't want to hear other things going forth. That's why he said what he did in Exodus 20. You note at verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. We're commanded. And he tells them, make no carved statue, any likeness of anything in heaven above, on earth, in the earth, under the earth, in the water, under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Right, he wants us to serve him exclusively. And we are to long for that pure milk of the word exclusively. But you know what's happening is actually a quotation from Psalm 84. And I'd like to spend some time over there in Psalms, in the Psalms, if you will. First, I grabbed this quotation from Psalm 42 because, well, because it's a beautiful thought and because it reminded me of the song. But Psalm 42, 1 and 2 said, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the living one. When shall I come and appear before him? You see, as the deer pants for flowing streams, my soul pants for you, God. That is the same word in translation, but it's the same idea that we long for God. We want to be with him. The way that the deer pants for flowing streams of water, that's true. The way that the newborn infant longs for the milk. And it's the same word over in Psalm 84. Again, in translation, albeit, but it's fairly clear that Psalm 84 is what Peter has in mind, and that's how we can spend a little time here. When you look at it, you can see in the first and second verses here, how lovely is your tabernacle, Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Well, that's a strong desire. A strong desire for him. Then if you're not convinced, well, let's uh, do some more convincing. Psalm 84 continues in its thoughts many different ways of, of setting your 
you know, your desire on God, setting your, your hopes on God, that it explores. And it says in the 10th verse, a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Yes, a day with God is better than a thousand days without him. To be the doorkeeper, or some have said, I'll be the doormat in heaven. <laughs> yeah, I'd gladly be the doormat in heaven versus being lost in a devil's hell. But did you see what he said? A day with God is better than a thousand anywhere else. And yet you read in Second Peter 3 with the Lord at verse 8, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. That's a quotation of Psalm 84. Our hope is in Him. Not in a timeline, see. Or, what about the 11th verse? For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from those who walk uprightly. He's the one that protects us. He's the one that gives grace. And it says, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And isn't that what we read in 1 Peter 2, 3? If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, the Lord does not withhold any good thing. He provides everything that we need, just like mother's milk. And that's where Peter's coming from. It's fairly clear that Psalm 84 is what he has in mind. But there's another place, Psalm number 119. I decided to treat it a little bit, you know, to separate it here, just so you can think about the fact that Psalm 119 is, is very long. It's kind of like its own little book. And many times over does it talk about this longing for the Word. The entire Psalm 119 is about the Word. It's an acrostic, if you will. It's many different stanzas. Every one of them has lines starting with a specific letter of the Hebrew al alphabet, and it goes through the, letter, or, uh, through the order, through alphabetical order. That's what Psalm 119 is. And it's all about the Word of God. And you find, for example, in that stanza that 17 through 24, where he says in the 20th verse, my soul breaks with longing for your judgments at all times. We want God's judgment. He's consumed with longing, says the English Standard Version. New King James said, my soul breaks with longing. You see the strength of this. When we say we desire the Word of God, that we long for the spiritual milk, we mean a strong desire. We long for it. Also at Psalm 119, much farther down in 131st verse, which is contained within the stanza of 129 to 136. But 131st verse, he said, I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for your commandments. And that's an interesting thing. I open my mouth, but not to talk, you see. <laughs> I open my mouth to pant, to desire for God's commandments. And yes, back again in the earlier stanzas, at the 19th verse, he said, Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them. Oops, that is the wrong page. Here we are, 19. I'm a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. A sojourner, a stranger, a resident alien. This world is not my home. A long-standing theme in Scripture. And 1 Peter 2 says just as much after telling us that we are a chosen race, a chosen generation, a special people for his own possession. He tells us also at 1 Peter 2.11, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, strangers and pilgrims, to abstain from the passions of the flesh. 
And also in Psalm 119, towards the uh, end there again, at 130, the entrance of your words gives light, it gives understanding to the simple. And it's what Peter said, isn't it? Desire, long for the pure milk of the word that by it you may grow up in everything into salvation. Yes, the unfolding of God's words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. The milk of the word causes our growth into salvation, into everything that we need. And yes, at the end of Psalm 119, verse 176, he said, I've gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. And it's also what Peter said in 1 Peter 2, at verse 25, you were straying like sheep, but you have now returned to the shepherd, to the overseer of your souls. Very clear, I think, that Peter's letter is heavily influenced by Psalms 84 and 119. And I ask you to indulge me in moving quickly through the idea of spiritual milk, the milk of the word. Let's take just a few minutes on this. The spiritual milk, the milk of the word. We talk about 2 Peter 2, and this is a matter of translation, I understand. And there are different translations, and there are differences in the way that they choose to portray some thought. This is not a bad thing. It's useful. We compare them side by side, and we get a a more complete picture. But it does say in the New King James, desire the pure milk of the word, whereas in the English Standard Version, it says long for the spiritual milk. Well, the underlying term here in the original language is a word that is talking about speech or something that is logic or logical, which is related to the word. The word is the logos, you may remember. So when we say this is logical, that is logos-based. And that's the reason why the New King James goes with the milk of the word or the wordy milk or having to do with words, having to do with speech or speaking. But it's also a term that's talking about intellect, thoughtfulness, uh, eloquence, you know, it's put forth as, you know, speech as opposed to music, which is an interesting thing to think about in light of questions about instrumental music, by the way, you know, we are taught, we teach, we speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, teaching and admonishing one another, which is something that a trumpet can't do. But this is the idea behind it. it, it so spiritual is, is a reasonable reading for this thing, but it's not the typical word for spiritual. Like if you're reading the word spiritual elsewhere in your Bible, this isn't usually the word that's underneath it. It's a different one. It's the word that appears in Romans 12 in the first and second verses. When he says that I beseech you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship according to the English Standard Version. They went with spiritual worship here, so they're consistent in using spiritual both here and at 1 Peter uh, chapter 2 and verse 2. But uh, other versions have gone with things like which is your reasonable worship or your reasonable service. Some have gone even farther with things like service according to the mind. And New King James goes with reasonable service there at Romans 12 and verse 1. 
But you can see in its context what it's saying. Don't be conformed to this world, verse 2, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove the good, the acceptable, the perfect will of God. These are the only two places where this original word is being used. So I like to use Romans 12 as the definition. What kind of milk is it? It is this kind, this this spiritual, reasonable, orderly, according to the word of Scripture kind of mindset. And really... Our parallel passage would be 2 Timothy 3. And it's well known, I suppose, and well quoted, well trod, that, uh, you know, 16th verse about all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's true. But look where it started. At 2 Timothy 3.15, Or, I'm sorry, I I want uh, 14. He tells Timothy, you must continue in the things which you've learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you learned them. From whom is masculine and singular. He's talking about God. God taught you this. The Spirit taught you these things. How? That from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. But see, from childhood, you've been acquainted with these sacred writings. That goes with 1 Peter 2, to like newborn infants, long for the milk of the word. The sacred writings, the holy scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation. Indeed, 1 Peter 2, 2, that by it, by that spiritual milk, you may grow up into salvation. Very clearly, our parallel passage. Yes, continue in what you have learned, he said, which follows with what we started with, that we are children maturing, if you will. We're growing. There's a continuance, uh, a trajectory upward, maturity. Knowing from whom you learned it, there's one source. It's God. And all Scripture is breathed out by God. All Scripture is profitable for all these things. In the 18th verse and 17, or uh, 16th and 17th, for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, for the complete furnishing of whoever would teach the scriptures. Yeah, nothing else will do here. What can we grow by? What do we have from God for our growth? What did God breathe out? What is profitable for everything that we need? Right? Infants will accept nothing but milk. We must accept nothing but the Bible. All right. Psalm 22 has a thought that I want to capture as we consider our soul's salvation today. In Psalm 22, it was captured in the ninth and tenth verses. You are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while I was on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Now we know this is Jesus from many different illustrations and proofs but it's very interesting this emphasis on mother's milk when he was at his mother's breast he learned to trust and that's true babies get what they need from mother's milk they get what they need from the milk that's everything they don't know how to do anything they don't know how to ask for anything they long for that milk and it's the one thing that they need it's the one thing that consoles them and you know without going into the crazed ideas of modern science proves the Bible, that's kind of silly, we nonetheless have made discoveries that are interesting about it. Discoveries about mother's milk continue to amaze. It is the means by which the baby gets um, the immune system. 
It's the means by which not just the nourishment that they need, but everything that they need over time, over months or years in some cases. The composition of mother's milk changes every day. It changes during the day. Mother's milk in the morning is a different recipe from mother's milk in the evening. It changes as the child grows through life, through, through the months, through the weeks, the months, the years, to accommodate what their nutritional need is at that stage of life. Who knew these things? You know, nobody knew this, but God knew. And it's interesting because it's saying God's word accommodates what we need. God's word is what we need. It's always what we need. It's just right. It's exactly tailor-made for you. It contains God's message for you. When you read the Bible, God speaks to you. And he says just what you need to hear. I think that's just a wonderful thing. It's a beautiful thing, and there's, there's nothing like it. It's incredible. Have you become a Christian? Have you become a child of God? Have you been reading this book? Read it. Read it every day. I remember in the band hall, we had a, a sign that said, you don't have to practice every day, only on the days that end. And why? That was the middle school one. The high school one said, only on the days that you eat. <laughs> Which is a safe bet for high schoolers. But you know, that one is kind of fun for me because, well, we eat every day, that's true, but what about the spiritual milk of the Word? We get our nourishment in the Spirit from the Word. Do you read your Bible every day? Do you spend time in God's Word every day? You should. It doesn't have to take a lot of time. If you're thinking, I don't have time, well, it doesn't have to take a lot of time. Read a psalm. Read the Proverbs. But stay in there because God speaks to you and you need to hear what God has to say. It's good for you. You grow by this. And there's nothing like it. It's amazing. Today, if you're not a Christian, become a Christian. Name Jesus as the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Be buried in baptism for forgiveness of sins. To begin the walk, the life of the Christian. We'll help you with that. We have water prepared. Are you a Christian who hasn't lived right? Repent. Go back to the elemental things. Let God talk again. Listen. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. If we can help you with our prayers on your behalf, if we can help you to obey the gospel, please let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song of invitation.